Hey, hey, so it's Dr. Mitch here again. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm trying this on the Zoom. Thanks so much to everybody from California Normal for sending me this hat. Thanks to Stephen Colbert for sending up these shirts. I'm going to get into the chronic effects of cannabis now. Bottom line, talking about effects of cannabis with regular use over multiple years and not currently intoxicated, right? So not acutely experiencing cannabis effects, but are there any changes in cognition just from having used it for a long time, all right? We've got a lot of methodological complications to be concerned about under these circumstances. So let's take a look, try to make some sense of this. Again, thanks so much to Stacy Farmer for beefing up these slides for me. So are there some take home messages? Well, if a single dose creates some impairments, essentially what we're asking is then, does consistent use lead to comparable deficits even in the absence of the current intoxication experience? So what do we have? Well, we've got to try to compare somebody to a reasonable control. Well, if we use daily users and compare them to folks who've never used, they're not randomly assigned and there's some obvious uh, personality related differences that might account for some of this. We want to make sure that the groups are comparable on other drug use too. So this does get kind of hairy. Generally, there's no gross impairment in chronic users if they're not currently intoxicated. And essentially, what does it boil down to? We're going to see some deviant brain waves in some very uh, novel predicaments. Uh, Stacy Gruber and that crew has shown if you get a really close look at some brain structure stuff, you will see some differences. I have no idea if any of it has much practical implication, but let's take a look. Now, obviously, we want to um, try to be methodologically sound when we critique either finding. So, in general, chronic consumption does not appear to create any weird brain structure changes, any big uh, covariation with IQ. But if you've got a really highly sensitive uh, EEG type evoke potential test where we're going to measure your uh, brain waves in response to certain stimuli, we can detect things. Or if we've got a functional MRI under some novel situations, all of these have some important problems to keep in mind though. First and foremost, all right. If there aren't showing any deficits, right? If the two groups aren't different, let's make sure we rule out some alternative explanations, including insufficient sample size, right? If I said, hey, look, this surgery doesn't do anything to anybody. I've tried it on three people, right? You wouldn't be too impressed, right? We want to have a, a big sample of cannabis users and a big sample of non-users. And then if, you know, if you've got less than 25 per group, I got to be candid with you. I'm, I'm not going to take the results very seriously. And I know I was just looking at a brain MRI study that had more authors than subjects. Like, sorry, man, I, I, I need to see your replication before I'm going to take your findings very seriously. So research that doesn't have a big enough end, though, if you've only got 10 people per group, the means have to be like 100 miles apart, right? And like really, before it's going to reach statistical significance, it's going to have to be huge. Now, people say, well, oh, look, I found it even with only eight people per group. If you're only taking eight people per group, the variation in your estimate of what is the population parameter of what is it like in the real world can really go awry as if just one person is an outlier, if just one person isn't much like everybody else, you've completely blown it. So ideally, let's get at least 25 people per group on these. And then if you don't have any deficits, I do have to ask about your sampling strategy, right? So in the beginning, everybody just studied uh, medical students or college students. Now, I'm not saying college is that hard to get into anymore, but there was a time at least when not everybody went to college and so a college student sample may have left the folks with the biggest deficits behind, right? Med school, certainly, you got to be a strange kind of wacko to, to go to med school. And you're no longer really a random sample anymore. Even studies that don't focus on students 
do end up with biased samples. So odds are high that uh, if I say you have to come to my lab, oh, it's a marijuana study, people are suspicious or paranoid, and the folks who are stoned 24-7 aren't going to make it there. So some of the best work has been done in Costa Rica, where folks will literally drive over to your house, catch you at home, but then are they acutely intoxicated? See where I'm going with this? So studies where folks are paid a lot of money, they're allowed to stay in the hospital overnight so that they can uh, make sure they haven't used cannabis that day. And then who's willing to do that? Is that sample going to generalize to other folks? We'll have to be super careful when we look at the bias sampling on these studies. So what's the solution? Ideally, I want to get chronic users daily use for at least two years. Impresses me. Now, Stacy's saying less than 10 years. Obviously, some of these things change with age. I got to admit, I can't uh, do the reaction time like I used to. All of these are going to be uh, varied with age, so we want to make sure age isn't different across the two groups. The visiting people at their homes, I think, is going to pick up now that we've got more uh, tax and regulate states. Thank you, California Normal. And Bowman and Peel, uh, Bob Peel's my, my, my granddad, basically. He's my advisor's advisor. They went to people in their homes in Jamaica, and even then they didn't see any cannabis-related deficits on a whole bunch of tasks, so just want to emphasize that. That must have been a fun study to do. Now, if you've got few or no deficits too, is the group membership legit? That is, are some people saying they haven't used when they have? Are some people saying they have, haven't when they, I'm sorry, when they, uh, saying they didn't when they did and vice versa? So we want to make sure that the non-users are really non-users and that the users are really users. And often you need some kind of urine screen in order to validate that. So yeah, here's a good solution, the, the urine screens. And what's funny is some recent studies showed 12% uh, of those re reported levels of use that could not be confirmed. And then 12% of the users may not basically have used, at least not recently. So we gotta gotta trust our biological measures in addition to self-report, at least while this is still an illegal behavior. Now, again, if you don't find uh, any real issues and the tests are just super easy, then it doesn't really mean that much. So uh, Stacy wrote here, how about this test recalling the alphabet, all right? There ain't enough pot in the world that's gonna make you forget that song. Uh, maybe the Hebrew alphabet or something like that, right? But bo bottom line is we wanna make sure the tests are sensitive enough. So here she writes, include difficult tasks in the studies that are more sensitive to challenges in brain functioning, all right? In particular, if there are enough items or if it's difficult, that's going to go better. All right. Quite a bit of research reveals no gross impairments, but again, I want to make sure we don't have biased samples or small samples or tests that are just too easy. Now, the tests that say, oh, look, cannabis makes this horrible brain anomaly, let's make sure we don't have, first of all, differences prior to use, meaning the folks who used cannabis weren't randomly assigned. Maybe they had this issue prior to ever using cannabis. Some of this P300 evoked potential stuff, we see that in schizophrenia and PTSD and stuff like that. I'm super suspicious of that literature. Bottom line is, uh, the a motivation stuff where they say, look, these cannabis users had lower grades, and then you look at their grades in fourth grade, and their grades were lower back then. So these may have been present all along. I can't randomly assign folks ethically to long-term use. Maybe we can talk about some alternatives to that. <clears throat> so if we can't do that, could we do chronic exposure for a year and then see if chronic users... And non-users, if somebody was willing to do that, that might be intriguing. Right? And then the other issue is polydrug use. So Mike Newcomb and I had a paper back in the 90s basically saying those who smoke marijuana often use more of other drugs. Right? Big news here. And again, I'm not saying there's a gateway. It's just people who like drugs happen to like drugs. So this may not be a deficit that's related to... I'm going to this may not be a deficit that's 
related to cannabis so much as some other substance that these folks might have used. So what's the solution? Obviously, if we had folks who weren't necessarily involved with other, other drugs besides cannabis, I think that's always a plus, and I encourage cannabis users to uh, make that a lifestyle. If we've got urine screens to confirm THC and other drug use, I think that's worthwhile. The animal work, I'm skeptical and apprehensive about, but in some ways this may be the, the only way to answer some of these questions. Truth be told, if we had serious cannabis-related deficits in chronic users, I think we would have identified them by now. And this notion of, hey, we just need a stronger machine, we just need a, a finer tuning on our MRI, obviously then it doesn't have much of a serious practical implication. And then we definitely want to tease out intoxication, acute use, from chronic use, right? So if somebody's had cannabis every single day for the last two years, and then they're going to come to my lab and say, oh, no, I didn't get high today, right? I've got to be a little bit suspicious. So the ones where they can pay folks to sleep at the hospital, that's always a plus. We do have some sobriety tests. I've sent folks home doing some of our neuropsych experiments where uh, they couldn't do the stand with their leg extended for 30 seconds. Like, obviously, they were either high or too tired to do neuropsych. Yeah. So yeah, anytime I can have an overnight experiment and then make sure that folks are functional when they wake up, that's always a plus. The other thing I want to emphasize is something called type 1 error. Those of you who got PTSD from your stats class, let's just ah, take a deep breath, okay? I'm really just talking about if you run 9,000 tests, some of them are going to be different by chance, right? So I literally, literally see these giant neuropsych batteries that they give to cannabis users and non-users. And then they say, look, they're different on these five. Well, if you do 100 stats tests and set your p-value to 0.05, five of them are going to be significant just by accident. Go ahead and pre-register. Tell me what tests you want to run. Tell me which way you're going to score it, right? None of this fancy schmancy moving it around. Then gather your data, and if you get it, I'll definitely be impressed. All right. So one of the classic studies that showed marijuana-induced problems performed 100 statistical tests. All right. It's one of those old Egyptian ones, and they made a huge deal out of it. Like, look, cannabis puts a hole in your brain. <clears throat> it's really just not the case. Again, we'd expect 5 out of 100 to be significant, or about 1 in 20, just by chance. All right. So yeah, the solution is let's focus on key cognitive functions now that we've identified the ones that we think are important. And I'd like to pick some that actually matter, right? Memorizing a list of words, when do you have to do that in life? How about something that's more associated with uh, some work that matters? Again, with that in mind, then let's take a look at the size of these effects. So if I get a huge sample, a very small effect ends up looking statistically significant, right? So again, one of the big Egyptians, when they said, look, much worse memory for numbers in the non-users, right? And it was this digit memory thing. The users remembered 2.75, the non-users remembered 2.94, all right? So less than a fifth of a word, of a, I'm sorry, of a, of a digit different, like, sorry, I, I just, I'm not going to justify throwing people in jail for something like that. So let's keep that in mind. Bottom line, let's make sure the effects are big enough and important, right? Involve some aspect of cognition that actually matters. So here's a nice one that compared light and heavy users. And what I like about this is then they probably weren't the same personality differences because folks at least had decided to use cannabis, right? And then the chronic users were worse on two out of seven of the measures, right? How big were the effects? At least they reached statistical significance. They had uh, over 60 in a group. All right, I will. All right, and they hit it on disinhibition learning and then that recognition and recall issue again where the uh, recall, they tend to come up with words that weren't there and they recognize words that weren't really on there. Then they start saying, oh, but maybe it's gender moderated, right? So I'm just going to look at the men. Just gonna, and you're fishing, right? Unless you're going to pre-register an effect like this, you're kind of messing around. 
So uh, Stacy has these summarized nicely. It says, among men in this study, heavier users were worse on the recall of pictures, on that Stroop color word thing I talked about in the acute part, and then uh, divided participants into groups based on IQ. Now again, right, once we start splitting them up and fishing, I'm really suspicious, but they're like, maybe folks who don't have very high IQs in the first place are more sensitive to this. <clears throat> okay, but let me see it replicate before I make any big deal out of it. All right. The other issue is with the adolescent samples, and I got to admit, these effect sizes are starting to impress me. I know everybody, you know, gets old and then says adolescents shouldn't misbehave, and now I'm sounding just like one of those old wankers, right? But the potential impact of cannabis in ad adolescents is markedly more dramatic than it is in adults. So we're starting to see <clears throat> structural changes in the brain related to the gray and white matter proportions. And at least one study suggested if you started using cannabis regularly before age 18, that could be problematic. And odds are high, if you wait till later, you're less likely to develop the usual problems and may have some uh, advantage for brain structural development. Um, so uh, Stacy's getting into one of the adolescent samples. So it's a, uh, memory troubles in two out of seven tests in 10 cannabis-dependent adolescents and 17 controls. Got them in a drug treatment program. They were inpatient, so they weren't acutely, right? But again, we're talking two out of seven and the sample size is only 10. I need to do better. I need to make something with a larger sample size. All right. <clears throat> when do things show up with more sensitive measures? Something that we call event-related potentials, right? These are literally evoked in the sense that there's a stimulus and that makes your noggin put out a certain wave. And that wave is our indicator of some underlying cognitive function. It's a little bit like trying to find out the rules of baseball from a microphone on the top of Dodger Stadium, but this is what we have. So what we're noticing is in situations where there's an event that you're supposed to process that includes processing tones and if they're long or short, right? So if I said, hey, okay, there's going to be a high pitch tone and a low pitch tone, and some of them are going to be long, and some of them are going to be short. And every time you hear the high-pitched long, go ahead and hit the space bar, right? <clears throat> well, when it is the high-pitched long, you get this change on your brain waves. Unfortunately, cannabis users, those who've used uh, two, two, two years daily or more, if... It's high pitched and long, they still get the normal brain wave, but even if it's low pitched, they get a little bit of a peak. And even if it's short, they get a little bit of a peak. Whereas folks who haven't used cannabis regularly, they can really distinguish between them more readily, right? It's as if the brain of the person who's used cannabis more sees everything as more connected. I'm not gonna comment. Now, what's that got to do with anything in real life? I'm hard-pressed to say, but we've run this enough times to say this is, this is cannabis-related. And uh, Nadia Solowidge down in Australia has shown that folks who quit for a month, some of this returns. And truth be told, if it's that reversible, I'm also I'm, I'm hard-pressed to say, ooh, this is so dangerous, right? But if you can keep that in mind, more importantly... The methodological issues that there are some uh, chronic related deficits in memory when it comes to uh, recall and recognition and these anomalies and evoke potentials, that's going to get you far. Which of the following is not a research method? All right, you guys know on an exam, I'm never going to ask you what is not. So Stacy did this, but it was cute. So uh, which of the following is not a research method that should be included in a study looking at memory? All right, using 87 types of memory tasks. Of course, I don't want to do that, right? I want to have a focused sample, a focused small set of tasks, pre-register it, and then that would be much more impressive. All right, so she's saying, yeah, that's the one. So 
I'm thankful to Dr. Farmer or Stacy Farmer for the summary of acute effects. She says marijuana intoxication has little impact on learning simple tasks or remembering information mastered prior to ingesting the drug. Of course, okay, remote memory is fine and any of those easy learning things. Intoxicated people are quite proficient at new skills and easy skills. They can probably recall events that occurred prior to this intoxication experience. We've got some inconsistent effects on simple reaction time, disinhibition, and vigilance. And then for complex reaction time, certain aspects of memory, reading, arithmetic, those are going to be impaired during intoxication. And then for chronic effects, we really want to be mindful of the confounds. But we do see long-term exposure does not change structure, does not change IQ, especially in adult users. The ability to perform quickly on multiple tasks may decrease with chronic use. And then evoked potentials, brainwave function, may be different in chronic users, even if they aren't intoxicated at the time. All right. I know that's a lot to absorb. Know that for an exam if you're in my class. Otherwise, what can I tell you? Thanks so much for tuning in.